Um, hello and namaste everyone. Uh, welcome to the Transitional Artificial Intelligence Research Group uh, seminar series. Today we have Megan Nguyen uh, presenting uh, the talk on sequential reversible jump MCMC for dynamic Bayesian neural networks. Megan is a PhD student, second year PhD student at the University of Sydney School of Computer Science, and she's also part of the Data Analytics for Resources and Environment, also known as GAIR. And uh, I am uh, uh, jointly supervising Megan with uh, Ming Nog Grant from uh, School of Business, University of Sydney. And Megan is interested in uh, Bayesian methods, deep learning, and uh, applications to climate problems, uh, the problems uh, in there. So Megan, you can begin the talk. Yes, now thank you guys so much for having me today. So today I will be talking about one of the uh, topics that I look into, which is uh, reversible jump MCMC for Bayesian neural networks. And the idea is that we want to extend the exploration of the scope of the neural networks that we work with. And so this is expected to be one of the, uh, it can, uh, this is gonna help us with a lot of dynamic uh, model exploration. So I'm gonna start with just some quick background. Uh, so we all know that complex machine learning models that involve a large number of parameters and high computational requirements uh, are used in many statistical applications. And so Bayesian methods provide a principal tool for statistical inference using posterior probability distribution. So this is just a quick, you know, intro into this um, in case some uh, people have not been familiar with Bayesian theory, but the idea is that we are looking at the posterior distribution over the parameters of the model in using the prior and the likelihood function uh, after observing data D. And the challenge is that the posterior distribution that we're looking at is often highly dimensional and non-convex. And so the challenge of computing it and sampling from it can be uh, addressed by approaches such as MC, uh, Markov-Chain Monte Carlo, MCMC, and variational inference. So I'm actually looking at both of the methods right now uh, in, in my research, but in order for, uh, for this specific presentation, I am going to be focusing on MCMC as a way to uh, compute the posterior distribution. So the key component is we have to find a way to propose the distribution in the metropolistic, metropolis hasting algorithm. And so sampling methods such as um, uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or Langevin MCMC uh, make use of the gradient information to update the posterior distribution. So Langevin Dynamics, which will be used in this paper, uh, basically adds Gaussian noise to the gradient of the log posterior density to avoid local conversions and has been used for logistic regression models, uh, Bayesian neural networks and Bayesian deep learning models. So, the question that we came up with is that uh, some, when we look at MCMC is there are often times when we have a structure of Bayesian neural network, but we have different, we want to explore different architectures within the neural network with different number of input and hidden neurons. So reversible jump MCMC extends the standard MCMC method to sample from the posterior distributions of space uh, with varying dimensions. So based on the fact that MCMC gives us potential to provide uncertainty quantification, RGMCMC also have the potential to provide uncertainty quantification for model parameters and topology. And we also use Langevin dynamics uh, to develop the effective proposal distribution. So RGM CMC now, when coupled with Langevin Dynamics, uh, can help us train the dynamic Bayesian neural networks uh, via a cascaded neural network architecture. So before we move on to how we apply RGM CMC to the Bayesian neural networks, we introduce RGM CMC in a more general settings. So let's say we have a collection of 
aim candidate models defined by a certain number of vectors of unknown parameters uh, ranging from one to m. And obviously we have this posterior distribution that is relevant to each of the model. And it is the gonna be our distribution of interest for the our RJMC MC sampler. But the difference is we when we implement the Markov chain transition from the current state K to um, now we are gonna propose a new state of um, theta uh, comma K and it will be pro drawn from the proposal distribution Q that is gonna connect us to the current state with the proposed state and the move is accepted with the probability of alpha uh, of mean of one of an alpha K that is calculated uh, as equation two. And this one is actually represent the parameters of the K's comma model. So it means that now essentially we are proposing the next state that we're proposing is not the state from the current model K, but the state from model K uh, comma. So K dot uh, comma. So we are trying to jump from one model to another by proposing a new state from a new model, from the next best model. So based on that, the right now for our project, we start with the submodels. Each of our submodel is constructed from a one hidden layer simple neural network, and we use sigmoid function as activation functions. And uh, in order to implement the Bayesian inference via MCMC simply, we, as we go back here, we have to specify the prior and the likelihood. In terms of, we are looking at two types of problems, uh, regression and classification problems. In terms of regression problems, the priors follow a normal distribution. And so this is the function that is the P, uh, the uh, probability distribution function of the prior uh, of the normal distribution. And let's say that we are, our output is a vector y with size uh, p. Then in this case, the likelihood function for this neural network is gonna be uh, in the form of a Gaussian distribution for the error term. And it will be um, written like this. And that is exactly what we use for likelihood for our uh, Bayesian uh, formula. And then why we think also why we look at regression class uh, data problems, we also look at classification problems as well. And the idea is that we define the set of indicator variables uh, as one if we manage to predict the, uh, cate the class, the category cor correctly, and zero if we cannot do the correct uh, classification. And so in terms of this case, the prior is a binomial prior and in, and this is a function for it, and the log likelihood is given by the equation four. So we have uh, managed to create the prior and the log likelihood for the Bayesian uh, uh, form uh, equation. Uh, now we're gonna move on to how are we gonna provide a way to propose a new uh, theta for every time we want to explore uh, the possible, the best theta for our all the models. And so that's why we come up with a sequential RJMC MC for dynamic Bayesian neural networks. So the idea is that the first step is we define a set of submodel by we define the submodel as the number of input and hidden neurons in a single layer simple neural network. So it's from the figure that I showed earlier. And then the transitions, uh, basically the, the transition from theta of a model K to another theta of model K, uh, K plus one, for example, is referred to as jumps. And those, those jumps will have the role of exploring parameter vector of the different submodels. And we call our implementation as sequential reversible jump because the jumps are in increasing order for every iteration. And I will explain more uh, later in uh, kind of some of graphics. So you, it's gonna be more intuitive. Um, and also 
since we are gonna, so for this method, we're gonna look into what happens if our models range um, are different in either the input or the hidden layer. And we have two strategies correspond to the two types of model, model architectures. So um, it's called dynamic input neurons or dynamic hidden neurons. So in order to understand how, uh, in order to understand how we actually implement this, uh, I would like to talk briefly about a new, uh, a new concept that we introduced in this paper, which is, um, is, which is the jump in our different submodels. So these jumps that we construct will basically allow the current submodel to utilize the knowledge of the previous one. And so obviously, if we, if we execute more jumps, the network architecture in terms of the number of parameters uh, of different submodels will increase. So let's say the first submodel I have, M1, is the foundational knowledge. So as we in execute uh, jump delta one, the algorithm jumps to submodel M2. And M2 submodel now will not only have the weights of the submodel one, but also the new weights that we train uh, in our, for, in our uh, Bayesian neural networks. And so obviously, if that's the case, as we increase the number of submodels, our submodel will have the most advanced architecture as jump delta two is completed. So this is a, a picture to describe the idea of how we're gonna in, uh, implement the um, the RJMCMC. And for this particular presentation, I will focus on jump i, meaning that the number of neurons in the input layer will be the one that vary as we jump across different submodels. So let's say that we have X as our inputs and we have here the number of inputs is D. So we choose any number D K that is as long as smaller than the total number of inputs as the number of inputs for each sub for submodel K. And so this X case will, I, XK in this case, for example, if I choose D equal to one in this case, DK is equal to one, then X1 represent the submatrix of symbols that will be the input layer for submodel MK. So let's say uh, for this example, I have X that have three different inputs. Obviously in implementation, we range the number of inputs up to 34. But for this case, let's say I have only the total number of inputs available. So the number of information uh, of uh, features available for me is three. So then what I have is the first submodel will be co will composed of X1 and all the hidden layers, because again, we only vary the input neurons. So the first submodel will compose of only X1, all these hidden neurons and the output neurons. And then for the second submodel, it actually includes also model uh, neuron one, uh, it, X, um, X1, but also X2 as well. And then the model now for model submodel two, it will include all these neurons and the five neurons in the hidden layer and the alpha neuron as well. So essentially we are um, constructing for, for each of them submodel we are constructing. We are just trying to add as many input features as possible to include as many knowledge as possible into uh, our models. And so again, because our models now gonna uh, only focus on jumping to more advanced submodels, that's why the final submodel, let's say M3, uh, M3 in this case, will, cons cons will have three neurons for input layers and then the, all the hidden neurons and the output neuron. And in this way, it has the highest number of neurons. So by doing the jump consequent, uh, sequentially like this, the last model usually the one that can give us the best performance in terms of classification or prediction of error in regression models. But uh, it saves us some time because now we save time from learning um, you know, all the neurons from model one and two because now only need to, all we need to do is to add new neurons for the next, uh, um, uh, exploration model. And so 
because of that, the feature space for input of three submodels will be X1 for the first submodel, X1, X2 for the second submodel, and X1, X2, X3 for the third submodel. So since uh, so after we find figure out the construction of each of the submodel, now our goal is to encode the knowledge of each of the submodel. And the idea is just that it's the, the knowledge is the weights that connect all these neurons. Let's say I have my submodel one that only has input X1 as my input neuron and hidden neurons as these five hidden neurons, then the weights that I have will be uh, W11. So one all the way to uh, five in this case. And then again, the, in the same, within the same submodel, since my hidden neurons are stay are intact, so we do not vary the number of neurons in this case, the hidden neurons will become just all these five neurons and its final output, and the weight will be from six all the way to 10. So that way our knowledge in, uh, for model one, for example, will be represented by the arrows with, uh, or by the weights that is represented by number one, two, three, four, five, all the way to six to 10. And after we apply this kind of formulation of encoding of the knowledge, we will learn, we will construct the sequential jumps between submodels. And so the jumps are constructed in, uh, we will have two vectors in each of the jump to represent the change in knowledge. So for, because now we are still focusing on jump I, meaning that the things that varies is the input layer. So let's decode that omega K is the first uh, knowledge vector that encode with uh, the input and the hidden layer vector layer, and then up, epsilon as the um, as the vector that encodes the knowledge between uh, hidden and output vector. So in this case, if I want to jump from model M1 to M2 we are just gonna take whatever knowledge that needs to be added and use that as our jump. And our and MCMC in this case will be used to train the jumps instead of the models. So we are trying to make it more efficient by training what is new instead of what is already there. So let's say for example, for if I want to move from model one to two, then the first vector in my jump will be constructed of any vectors that are not included in model two, uh, in model one, but all is all included in model two. So it will be represented by the arrows 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. So it's correspond to these um, weights right here. But again, since the number of hidden neurons in this case remain consistent across three submodels, uh, in case of my jump delta one, um, my second vector will be an empty vector because I'm adding new, no, uh, no new knowledge to the hidden to output layer. So by using this um, uh, past, uh, past visual general visualization of the of the example of the models with only three submodels, we now want to generalize the process uh, of transferring the knowledge across submodels uh, as follows. So the jump will still be encoded as omega and epsilon. And again, it represents the knowledge, the new knowledge between input and hidden layer. And this one is the new knowledge between hidden and output layer. And if you look at um, the, the one that we are training, um, and I will show you in the algorithm later, but the one we're training again is this, uh, is the psi one, which is, the one that constructs our H of our delta, our jump delta. And um, theta in this case, because uh, I just want to write this to show that essentially we still, rem the number of parameters in each of the model will still remain the same. We're not changing the, any of the weights that will be used in, the, in this algorithm. 
or the idea is just that we are to choose different parameters to train. And so we, if we see, if we look at this, then we can observe that, for example, psi one, which represent our first jump is just equivalent to the entire weights of the first submodel, while as uh, theta m is construction is the constructed from the parameters of all sub three sub models. So it can cover all the parameters possible of the of the of the all the sub models that we look at. So so be, beside using that new are um, uh, the jumps in the different in the architecture, we also look at using range of ingredients proposal distribution um, in order to kind of help us in, improve the accuracy as well the efficiency of our training process. So the range of ingredient proposal distribution is based on range of dynamics where are simple parameters that represent the bias and by the weights and the biases are refined to uh, one step gradient descent via by pro, uh, propagation along with the Gaussian noise. So the idea is that for each of the submodel, uh, for example, if I want to propose a new uh, parameters for my next submodels, um, I will be using my current parameters, uh, my current parameters, and um, using a normal the British the proposed the distribution for the proposal will be a normal distribution. And the sigma here, uh, and the sigma here will be composed of the identity matrix along with some kind of uh, learning, some kind of learning rate. And for this case of some some kind of discretization, this discretization step. And in terms of the mean of all this normal distribution, I'm going to update it using the uh, one step gradient descent here and. Epsilon in this case is the learning uh, rate. So now that we have used, uh, introduced two big components in the algorithm, uh, this is a big quick summary, uh, summary of the sampling algorithm. So the aim here is we can draw the samples from the distribution um, of our set of submodels. And the idea is that we have our final goal is the big submodels, uh, the, the big the, the big models that include all of the potential submodels. And so we're gonna try to see if we can train the sequential jumps. That's why the first step is to set the number of sequential jumps. And for this case, for example, see if we have three submodels that we want to explore, we will have the two, uh, the number of jumps we have is two. And then we obviously need to define the network architecture, meaning that we will need to figure out which is the number of input uh, neurons, which is the number of hidden neurons and output neurons. And so in terms of the whole training process, the first step is to initialize the parameters for our proposed psi k. Uh, again, for this one, we are going to train psi, um, the jump instead of the parameters of individual models. And so that's why if you look at my whole, um, the proposal, uh, what I'm focusing on is if I can find the uh, best, the next best proposal values for my theta. So let's say, uh, I'm gonna give an example. If, if I my jump is accepted, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna obtain my jump that is accepted to my current theta in order to, create the parameters for the next model. And so that's how we jump to the next model, submodel, because we are training that jump so that we can obtain to the current theta and create a new set of parameters for our next uh, model. So obviously if the jump is, um, is rejected, then we still have to explore in that range uh, in that same submodel. But if the jump is accepted, then now essentially we're changing our range of exploration to, to explore the potential parameters for submodel K plus one instead of K. Uh, so the last step is just a step of obtaining the jumps that is accepted to the current theta in order to jump to the next different dimension. Um, so after using this, uh, we come after coming up with the construction of the jumps and 
the land driven dynamics, we use uh, we have decided to experiment on both regression and classification data sets. Uh, one of the data sets that we use, uh, the regression data sets are used as follows in this screen. Um, all of them are some, so the first, these, uh, the first five data sets are simulated data set and, it is, and they are univariate data set. But in terms of energy and Avalon, it is multivariate data set. And in terms of classification data set, we look at five different data sets with different number of um, instances. And so I have included just the results for the regression problems. Um, and this one is for jump H. Uh, jump H meaning that our construction of neurons will only the number of the submodels will vary in the number of hidden neurons. Why we stay, we keep them, we keep the input neurons uh, the same across all the submodels. And if you look at the results, we notice that um, using three jumps and exploring three different submodels, all these submodels in the end provide comparative uh, predictive performance uh, with the training set around uh, training set around 0 0.03 and, and test performance around 0 0.03 as well. And to further demonstrate the, um, the idea that we want to quantify uncertainty, we also, um, also create some kind of visualization to show the uncertainty quantification in our prediction for our sunspot data set. And this one is for jump I. So we're, we're, we are only looking at three different submodels that vary in the input neurons. And we highlight the fifth and uh, we highlight the fifth and the 95 uh, percentile confidence intervals to quantify the uncertainty given by the posterior distribution of weights. And we do observe that the difference between the actual observations and the fifth, uh, the 50th and the 95 uh, predictions for the test data set. So these are the test data sets, um, increase as we introduce more models. So if you can see here, it kept go, it is kind of hard to see, like if, unless I zoom in, but it's going, it's going up as I increase some models. So this uh, difference actually simplifies the increase in uncertainty of not only the overall predictions, but also the network topologies. So it, as we make the architecture more advanced, we are, the uncertainty uh, increases. So in some kind of food for thought after we run some of the experiments is that we can we can synergize this method with multiple machine learning strategies such as multi-task uh, task learning or transfer learning. Um, and our method uh, allows us to create a more uh, dynamic uh, structures for our exploratory, exploratory spaces. So it's especially helpful for Bayesian model selection because we can show, we can using our method, we can tell which model architecture would probably work the best for our prediction of classification data problems. And our framework actually extends the cascaded neural network architecture via Bayesian multitask learning that has been developed for dynamic time series prediction. And we were also motivated by the co-evolutionary multitask learning which defies um, each cascade of the network with different number of input features for dynamic time series. So now we are, instead of doing just input features, we also look at hidden neurons as well. And so from the, and since we are inspired by two of the methods, which are Bayesian multitask learning and the co-evolutionary multitask learning, we decided to compare this method with all the relevant methods. And we noticed that our method performs significantly better than BM's, uh, the two previous methods for most time series regression problems. Uh, but of course, uh, this method has uh, certain limit limitations. And the first limitation is that it's, it's gonna be, 
the conversions does take time and that is a big challenge for large models and big data problem. And the other problem is uh, whenever you look at the, the input features uh, in our models, some models, uh, especially for classification problems, we can see that we have to se carefully select which input we can put into the models so that it can learn better and perform better. Uh, so for now, because uh, for our classification problems, since the we do not have the domain experts, so the selection of features were kind of more so based on our running of the experiments to see which features should be included in our different submodels. But in the future, if we can include domain experts uh, selection of features, then we can define the input space for different submodels the best way that we that it should that the model uh, deserves. And in terms of future direction for this uh, this um, new methodology, we in the future we think of combining both jump i and jump h. So for both regression and classification problems meaning that now the architecture will not only range in the input layers, but also in the hidden layer. Uh, but we will also extend this uh, dynamic, this RJMC problem to deep learning models such as convolutional and recurrent neural networks. And we also look to implement variational inference um, to in, given the fact that the number of parameters can increase in the future as we impl in, implement a larger scale architectures. So variational inference might prop, uh, help us more uh, in this case. So in conclusion, we did may, uh, we presented a dynamic Bayesian neural network framework that uses uh, RJM CMC to train the model parameters given the dynamic nature that can range in the input and hidden layers. And we, our results show that the methodology can train very well and provide good accuracy. But the most important thing is that it can provide uncertainty quantification for dynamic input and dynamic hidden neural settings. Um, and we do know that we do sh show that dynam these dynamic Bayesian neural network topologies have higher model uncertainty compared to fixed model uh, topologies. So. This method sets the foundation for further implications in deep learning frameworks and more advanced neural network architectures uh, and why we want to extend further to variation inference. So that's it for my presentation. Uh, I am open to any questions that you may have and thank you so much for listening. Thank you, uh, Megan, for a wonderful presentation. Um, it's a good work, and uh, we know that the paper is under review, and we hope that uh, the paper gets accepted soon. So I'll open uh, the floor for uh, questions and comments. Yes, yeah, so that was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, now, I haven't read the paper, so it's just off the cuff comments, but if you're looking at number of layers, then why not just calculate the margin likelihood for um, one layer, two layers, three layers, and four, and so on, instead of doing reversible jump? You're not going to cover all the models, but uh, it could be a lot faster and more stable than uh, what you're doing now. I don't know how stable your MCMC is now, uh, but uh, an alternative is to just look at, you've got layers and then you've got number of inputs in each layer, but why not look at, um, how long does it take you for serious examples to do this? Um, honestly, it takes really quite fast. So the thing that we decided to do our reversible jump is also because of efficiency as well, because um, it's actually fast. It's compared to just doing like MCMC and marginal likelihood. This one is also like comparatively fast compared to the current methodologies. And the reason we decided to do reversible jump because we thought about also not only jump to the more archi advanced architecture, but also less advanced 
So right now we're looking at sequential jam only, but in the future, the jump can be back and forth. And so that's yeah. why, yeah. Yeah, but uh, it can't be any faster than, it can't be any faster than um, doing MCMC -MC just with a given yeah, architecture. It, yeah, I agree. It's not faster, but it is comparatively fast, but fast, yeah, not faster. So that's something that's that we can keep in mind, yeah. Yeah, so basically, uh, I mean, this this method is exactly what you'd use uh, with variable selection for non-Gaussian models. Uh, you would just, you, you could use that uh, because here you've got clumps of variables that you leave in or out. So it, de it depends on how fast uh, you can do it compared to doing single models. Because it must be also that if you the jump is too big, you're just going to reject a lot. Mm, yes, yes, I agree with that. Um, to add to this, uh, Robert, thanks for the question. I think uh, when the reviewer also asked a similar question in the paper. So it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't me. Yeah, it wasn't <laughs> you. Good to know. But uh, so the way we address it, the vision. But it was, the, but the, but I know who the reviewer. No, I'm just kidding. I don't. The, the reviewer was, was Min Gok, actually. Oh no, he's a co-author, right? All right. Um, so go ahead, go ahead. So uh, the the thing is that uh, the reviewer asked if uh, you know having individual models will have better capability in terms of predictions and we see that if you run separate uh, MCMC models, MCMC based models and compare with the reversible jump, our results are a little bit poorer in terms of the prediction accuracy. Yeah, on the other is, hand, on the other hand, the good thing about what you're doing is that you can do model averaging with this so your predictive model will be a weighted average of individual models. Yeah. So you don't have to select the actual model. The MCMC will give you the weights for various models. And therefore, you know, you don't have to say, um, I'm going to select model three. And that's it after doing the reversible jump. I don't know if you're doing that for prediction. Are you doing the model averaging or are you doing the, you select the model and then you, um, you select the model and then you um, uh, do the prediction. I don't know which way you're doing it. Uh, I can, uh, um, so I can answer that. We are actually doing both of it. So we do have, um, I didn't show it here, but we do have the prediction uh, accuracy for individual submodels. And then obviously they, the people can choose, you know, the one that perform the most, speak up the best. And to be honest, sometimes including all, like having more advanced architecture is not better performing. So that's why it's actually very great. No, no, I'm not saying having an advanced predictor, I'm saying, you can predict using the model average, or you oh, yeah. can predict using the best model. We using both of. We also uh, average out the accuracy prediction uh, prediction accuracy as well. And so which, we which is better? Them. Which is better? Um, model averaging average is better for, to compare with other methodologies, but in terms of individual models, we it helps with uh, model selection really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm saying you can do reversible jump, but then at the end, you've got a choice of two ways of doing the prediction. One is to do it from the model average. Yeah. yeah. And the other way is to do it from the best model. So which way do you do? So which way do you do it? I think for the paper, we are using the best performing models. Yeah, you can also do model averaging, yeah. which might actually give you an even better answer. Mm. Well, just uh, now, There are two ways to do model averaging as well. One is to say that um, 
I'm going to run everything and then I'm going to predict. Yeah, yeah. Using the weighted average, or you can say that at each point in the MCMC, I'm going to do a prediction. Mm. So you do a prediction on top of the MCMC. It's not part of the MCMC, but it's on top of the MCMC. And but then you have both the results, but you also have the prediction where you're averaging at each iteration, you're getting a prediction. And that's probably the best of all. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Just, uh, just to uh, make it more clear, uh, the, the contribution of this paper is not it's basically arguing that if there comes a case, if you are just using one model, right? Yeah. And, and that model basically does not have uh, inputs to the model at some point of time, mm. right? So for example, let's say that you have developed a model that is supposed to uh, drive a vehicle, and you have uh, four camera sensor cameras in the front of the vehicle. And if one of the sensor camera breaks mm -hmm. or there's some issue there with that sensor. So will your model, that single model be able to uh, come up with a decision? So standard neural networks cannot come with a decision because the training data is not there when the, in case of the missing data. So it is, this is the way this cascaded neural network architecture is, is that it is going to make uh, use of the different knowledge modules and going to come to a decision if there is no input or feature input. But then this was already developed, uh, which I developed in 2016 when I was in Singapore. But the training algorithm was a uh, neuroevolutionary algorithm, and it was known as coevolutionary multitask learning. What Megan has done, she has taken out the coevolutionary multitask learning algorithm, and she has replaced that with a reversible jump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but that doesn't address what I was saying. Um, it, um, I mean, if you're going to have different conditions, then uh, that's something different. I mean, I'm just talking about data. And I'm talking about multiple models, which don't even have to be neural networks. And I'm talking about how to how you, how you doing the forecasting, even with uh, a single model. The way you can do forecasting uh, two ways. One way is to at each iteration of the MCMC, you do what you need. You do the forecast. And then you average over your forecasts or whatever and get uncertainty quantification as well. So suppose that you've got Y and X are your inputs and theta and you do your MCMC. And at the, for a given theta, you then um, output Z. And you want to forecast Z. You output Z and you do that for every iteration. So you've got a whole bunch of Zs from your posterior and you can do uncertainty quantification on, on the prediction, not, or you can just estimate the whole thing and then plug in an estimate of the mean of theta, some estimate of theta, and then do the prediction. So I'm not talking about what, so what you are talking about is very interesting, uh, but uh, I wasn't talking about that. But anyway, Megan, this was really good and thank you very much. So I won't say, anything more and uh, I'll let... Uh, Robert, you can come to the roundhouse uh, in five minutes, we'll be there and then you can... I, I, I can come to the roundhouse, but I'm at uh, I'm at home and uh, so, I'll, so instead I'll go into the little square house. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, okay, but that was great. You. That was great, Megan. That was really thank nice so work much. and uh, yeah. talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, Robert. Thanks. Okay. okay, we'll take some questions from the floor here. Anybody has any questions or comments? Yes, Ranjit. <laughs> all good. Okay, all good. Yeah. Uh, it? No? No? Okay, thank you, Megan, for a wonderful uh, presentation. And yeah. uh, looking forward to the paper. <laughs> and thank you very much, everyone.
Thank is you so the much. Paper, is the paper on archive or not yet? Uh, the paper is not on archive because we hope that the paper will be accepted soon. So we are going to uh, put this talk in the GitHub of the paper and hopefully by uh, next month or so, the paper will we'll share the paper with everybody. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you guys. Bye.